nestled in the foothills of Virginia's Allegheny Mountains. The Omni Homestead has been welcoming guests to this idyllic location since 1766. A favorite retreat of 22 American presidents. The beautiful 2,000 acre property is the perfect place to soak up some genuine southern hospitality. Or soak in the mineral baths just like President Thomas Jefferson did in 1818. We are making Pullman loaf in 18th century brick ovens, Hassan pfeffer, venison stew, stuffed venison loin, and Virginia brook trout with Brussels sprouts and fingerling potatoes. There is much to discover here in Hot Springs, Virginia, including a taste of history. What a historic moment. I'm in the bake shop of the Omni Homestead with Ashley, who is one of the pastry cooks. And guess what I get to do? I get to use an oven that was built in the 18th century, but more so, I get to use something that I was always curious about, and it's a Pullman pen. So Ashley, how many of those Pullman loaves do you make a day here? We make between about 12 to 20 Pullman loaves per day. We use bread flour, shortening, a little bit of dry milk solids, and uh, water, yeast, that's it. And you let it uh, boof a little bit? Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna punch it down. Mm -hmm. Punching it down releases some of the air, makes it a little bit easier to And shoot. takes your frustration out, right? Yes. There you go. <laughs> Were you aware that those uh, Pullman laws were actually designed by Mr. Pullman? Really? Yeah. The homestead became very popular in the 18th century for the elite. The elite meaning people that had enough money to, to build their own railroad car. Mr. Pullman, who liked beautiful toast, had to design a way to cook the bread under the railroad car. Because obviously, if you put a regular loaf pan without a lid on it, and the railroad car would go all over the place, would bake over. So he had his people design a loaf pan with a lid on it. And I know you got about the lid because you don't want your bread later to stick on it. Right. So we butter the whole pan because when the bread breaks, it takes the shape of the pan and then it doesn't stick. Could you grab some flour? Of course. So I'm just going to shape it to the length of the pan just a little bit. And how long do you let it rise before you put it in the oven? About 30 minutes. And you bake it at what? Bake it at about 400 degrees. 400 degrees. Perfect. In it goes. Just put the lid on it. Mm -hmm. This is a moment in life. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Look at it. Now, I assume it's rested now for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? The next step is to bake it in the oven. We can um, actually load it right here. Mm -hmm. I can see why it's 50 Pullman loaves fit in the release. Yeah, during the 18th century, there's actually a coal chute in the back that was used to heat the oven. Perfect. Gosh. What a beauty. Perfect square shape. Feel the crispness of it. It smells so good. It the, does. The, the aroma. I don't think there's anything better. Mm -mm. I really want to thank you for showing me today this marvel of engineering of an oven that's one of a kind. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Thank you. In the late 18th century, as Western expansion took root, many Americans believed that nothing but the Pacific Ocean lied beyond the Allegheny Mountains. It was a time of exploration and new discoveries. George Washington, as a young officer in the Virginia militia, acted as a surveyor. This is back in pre-colonial days. We're still members of the Crown. The French were here, the English were here. At the end of the French and Indian War in 1764, Captain Thomas Bullitt received a colonial land grant of 300 acres that contained natural mineral springs and moved his militia company to the area. After two years of clearing the land, they constructed an 18-room wooden hotel that opened as the Homestead. Back in those days, it was very difficult to get people to stay in the militia. So people like Washington and Bullitt would offer land. These homesteaders not only built the hotel structure, they also constructed a bathhouse around a frequented hot spring. Bullitt died during the American Revolutionary War 
and his family eventually sold the homestead to Dr. Thomas Goode, along with the resort in Warm Springs and Healing Springs. He draws people in. He offered various uh, therapies, the consumption of the water. Presidents like Taft would come here. He'd usually come and stay two or three months at a time. James Madison, Franklin D. Roosevelt. We've had 22 of those so sitting presidents to actually come to the homestead. They found by soaking in the pools, by consuming the water, this was a great elixir and it drew many, many people from all around. When the Ohio Railroad introduced service to the homestead, the resort flourished with travelers from Cincinnati and New York. In 1881, prominent railroad lawyer Emmy Ingalls and J.P. Morgan raised more than $1 million to build a completely new hotel. Well, the hotel itself is history. You know, 248 years old. We've got equipment in the hotel that we've been using for 100 plus years. You know, our pastry shop, we still bake bread in an oven that was built when the building was rebuilt in the early 1900s. But our customers have a modern day expectation. Adam. Chef. It's an honor to meet you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What are we making today? What's so what's today it? we're going to be making a Hassenpfeffer. Woo. Traditionally, it's a one-pot dish. In the 1700s, when the homestead first opened, farm-to-table wasn't a trend. It wasn't a hashtag. This is the way everything was done in the valley. So before there were supermarkets or really even a train station, rabbit, venison, things of this sort were how people ate because that's how they provided their own sustenance. But before we do anything with the rabbit, we've got to make a really, really strong marinade. Yeah. Chef, if you want to start smashing, we're going to use I a will. little clove. Red wine vinegar is two parts, and the red wine is one part. How much clove you want in there? Uh, you're looking for about a half teaspoon to a teaspoon. A little pepper in here. And I'm also going to add a little bit of thyme. Juniper berry. And juniper berry is most often used in veal and beef, but the flavor is fantastic. We use it in sauerkraut and everything like this in the black forest. Exactly. The, the, how do you want the, the We to crush it, extract the oils, a little rough chop over. So have you got onions? Only yep. All of it? Yeah, we're going to put all of it in there. So the rabbit's gonna take on all of this flavor and the vegetables are gonna to help to balance the flavor and give a softness to the little rabbit as well. Well, Chef, now that we're done with the marinade, it's time to cut our rabbit. It's time to cut our rabbit. So as you can see, it's completely denuded. Just like any other four-legged carcass, we're gonna go ahead and disjoint where it's softest. The marinade already develops a personality. Yes, it certainly Unbelievable. does. Unbelievable. So we're going to slide that in there. As it braises, these bones that have been cut are going to release the gelatin that's eventually going to thicken our broth. In no way, shape, or form yeah. should a marinade go into a finished dish without coming to a rolling boil to, to kill all the bacteria. Now, the thing with the uh, rabbit now, as I said earlier, you know, it can marinate probably as little as four to six hours. Obviously, the longer it goes, the More better flavor. it's going to be. We're taking the rabbit out of the marinade, and I'm just going to pass that to you, bring it to a full boil. Boiling this will also help to release the rest of the flavors Absolutely. in these vegetables. There's so much harmony in this marinade already, I can I get all the flavors. It's going to start singing all by itself, yep. isn't it? It does. Now, while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and start my pan, and it's always hot pan cold yep. oil, yep. so nothing will stick, and we're going to use a little bit of lardon, which of course is our favorite food. Because yeah. in the Allegheny Mountains, you do not cook anything without lard. <laughs> I, I there is a that. lot of pork. And at the same time, I'm now going to flour the rabbit. All-purpose flour, salt, pepper, and of course, there's always time for fresh herbs, is there mm -hmm. not? And what we're looking for is a nice golden crust on both sides. It's going to take about four to six minutes. Easy. It's not too long. Marinades come to a yep, boil now. Done. We know it's safe. We're going to add it back to this pan. Enough to cover. Ah, look at those vegetables. Let it all come to a boil, and then we're gonna finish it with our demi-glace. Ah, uh, yeah. And you're looking for about half the measure of the liquid that was already in there. And now, without much ceremony, we're gonna go inside. Breach the gap. Fits in. Not to lose any heat, let's close the oven door. There's one last thing that we need to do. The rabbit's in the oven taking its sweet time. We want it to cook low and slow. But we, the dish is not complete without a few crucial things. Number one is croutons. And then I've also got on this side some mushrooms and some pearl onions. But let's start with the croutons. I'll go ahead and add a little bit of clarified butter. Clarified butter. And I put my croutons right in. 
Great sizzle, that's exactly what you want to see. While that's going on, I've got some mushrooms. We're going to add to the pan of mushrooms some pearl onions that we cooked a little bit earlier. And the pearl onions are very special because we just cooked them with a little clarified butter. A touch of sugar just to, for a quick caramelize and they never stopped moving in the pan. And at the very last we added some cracked peppers. What do you think of my high uh, so uh, Your croutons are fantastic, chef. <laughs> <laughs> I cook elbow to elbow with you any day. <laughs> yes. So, we're almost ready. Yep. We're ready to assemble? I'm ready. Let's go. So, Chef, it's been sitting in the oven. We let it go a little bit longer because I think both you and I agreed that we wanted the sauce to really Absolutely. have some impact. Which you can tell. Yeah, I mean, the, it's come together beautifully. The mirepoix cook perfectly, and it just smells terrific. First, we're going to go in with our mushrooms and onions, the croutons, and the lardons are going to finish us off. Put the sauce on top. That's it. We are ready to go. Mm, the flavors are so well in harmony. It's just, it's lovely. spectacular. In keeping with our team, the Allegheny Mountain Cuisine, we're now going to make a venison stew and Jeffrey, the banquet chef of the Omni Homestead, is going to show me. So what we're going to start with is a fresh local venison and we're going to start with a marinade. So for the vegetables, we're going to cut them a lot coarser than the previous rabbit dish. It's going to stew with the meat to help build the flavor. And then we want to do a larger cut so that it doesn't break down and turn to complete mush. So you want to be able to still identify the vegetable later when the venison stew is done. You wine, your vinegar, your different spices in there. So it's a coarse chopped mirepoix. Whatever shape you make, you want to keep it the same size because they all cook the same speed. So if you make one too small, they're going to disintegrate and you won't see them. So the next thing we're going to do with the marinade is we're going to add in our venison. And then with that added in, we're going to let it marinate at least overnight, but preferably for up to two days so to help really build the flavors and make it intense. Fantastic. And it'll really help cut down the gaminess of the venison. The silver skin, if you don't cut it off, it won't actually break down like the fats in the venison when you bake it out, so it'll get really tough and chewy. So the bacon is a house-cured bacon. What we're going to do is we're going to slice it into lardones, which is a nice long cut. We're going to render that out to start pulling out the fat and make it nice and crispy. Once that's crispy, we're going to pull the bacon out and we're going to add in the mushrooms to saute that. Next thing we're going to do is the beef. We actually need the flour. We actually marinate it with the vegetables. If you wanted to make your life a little bit easier, you could put it in a sachet with cheesecloth and a little butcher's twine. And then you can just yank it out. Then you can just yank out the vegetables, separate the meat from the marinade. The bacon's starting to crisp up. We're going to actually add in our mushrooms and let those saute. And those are all mushrooms from the region, right? These are all regional mushrooms that are actually picked from the forest. Springtime, they sprout up everywhere with an overabundance to where we have so many, we don't even know what to do with them all. So we lightly flour the venison. We have a really nice hot pan. We're going to touch a clarified butter, and we're going to get a nice golden brown on the venison to build the flavor. You want to make it nice, but not too hot, so you don't want to burn the flour. You don't. You also really don't want to overload the pan. If you put too much in, you're not going to get the nice caramelization. The mushrooms are nicely cooked. We're going to go ahead and add in our onions, and we'll saute this off with the mushrooms. Your beef's looking nice. We can probably go ahead and add in the vegetables in the marinade. Put the vegetables and the marinade together? Everything goes in together. Right. So because we did marinate the venison in here, we do want to make sure we bring up the marinade to a boil. To Absolutely. Make sure that we do cure any bacteria that could be present. Yep. Perfect. Chef, now that the venison's come up to a boil with the marinade, we actually want to transfer it into a heavy cast iron pan so we don't burn it. And then after we get that in, we're actually going to add in some more demi-gloss that we've actually fortified with the venison bones mm -hmm. to really enhance the flavor. With the flour that's already on the venison, it's also going to be a self-thickener that's yep. going to bring a lot of flavor to this dish. Perfect. So now that we have the venison coming up to a boil, we're going to go ahead and put it into our antique oven and let it finish in there low and slow and let the meat cook out and get nice and tender. So we've got the bacon fat in, and we're going to finish it off with the fresh croutons to give it a little bit of a crunch. Fantastic venison stew you made here. I can just taste the Allegheny Mountain right in here. It is spectacular. Just down the road from the Omni Homestead is something unique that has brought people back since 1761. The Jefferson Pools near Hot Springs, Virginia, are bathhouse spas that were built in the late 18th century. We always search for unique historic locations the world over. Well, it does not get any better than this today. 
They are fed by natural hot springs that deliver a consistent, temperate water and soothing minerals to bathers. Legend has it that these magnificent, crystal clear warm springs were discovered hundreds of years ago by Native Americans as they journeyed through the Allegheny Valley. But even outside of the legend, archaeologists have found evidence these local waters have been used by humans for more than 9,000 years. They could actually see the water bubbling out of the ground. They would look around for a, a vessel or something like that, took a big scoop, a big drink, made a terrible face. It was very sulfurous indeed. The healing waters of Hot Springs, Virginia, lured George Washington to recuperate here in 1756. Many other American presidents continued the tradition by coming to Hot Springs when seeking respite, solitude, and renewed health. Two bathhouses, referred to as the Jefferson Pools, stand on the site today. This building, which was built in 1761, is preserved, so it's exactly the way it was then. Early colonial records show that the first pool was built in 1761 for use by ladies and gentlemen alike, though at alternate times of the day. Taking waters means uh, the consumption of waters, as well as uh, soaking in them. So a full program of soaking and consuming was regarded as a way for better and perfect health. The original hot springs pool is the oldest spa structure in the United States. My mentor, Thomas Jefferson, was here in 1818 he had a, a bad case of rheumatoid arthritis with his uh, wrist and hand, and he came primarily to seek a solution to that particular property. The pool inside is about 120 feet in circumference and holds 40,000 gallons of constantly flowing crystal clear mineral spring water. So nice. Unbelievable. What a moment. Imagine I'm in the sand spot where Thomas Jefferson soaked himself in 1818. The water is 99 degrees, it feels spectacular. It's almost like tingling, I guess, all the sulfur and all the minerals in there. A moment I will cherish forever. Chef. Hello. What a pleasure to get to cook with the executive chef of this fantastic resort, the Omni Homestead. We're going to do a roasted venison loin today, and it's one of the meals that we are really proud of here in Bath County because you probably saw all the deer running around, and it's a staple That's for us. Here. We're going to add the wild rice to our bowl first, walnuts, add our fruit, dried apricots, roasted chestnuts. So the cranberry is just going to crush a little bit so yeah. you get, to get a flavor out? Yep. We're going to season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. We're going to take some of this fresh rosemary, and the last thing we're going to add is a little bit of clarified butter. The butter we use is from the Homestead Creamery. So we're just going to mix up our stuffing mix here, kind of get it incorporated, make sure the butter gets worked through, so that's going to let it be able to stick. So now, we're going to take our venison loin, open this up, and we're going to lay it right in there. Perfect. Okay. And we're going to fold it right back over and wrap this. In lardo, what this is going to do is it's going to lock in the moisture. Yep. We're going to make a nice sear on there and it's going to give it a great flavor. So now we're going to go ahead and truss the venison loin. So since venison is by nature lean, Very lean. adding a little uh, fat to it uh, enhances the Absolutely taste. critical. We're going to season the outside of our venison loin with salt and pepper. We're going to go ahead and sear that. Turn it. Yes, it, once it's once we seared for about a minute over here, we're going to turn it over. We're going to sear that side and then we're going to add some shallots that it's going to rest on and maybe a little bit more of the rosemary. As the venison cooks, the fat and lard will drip down under the shallots and the rosemary and then all that is going to come back and up. It perfumes the meat from so the bottom up. We're going to take our venison loin. Now that we have it properly seared and sitting on its little nest of, of, of shallots and rosemary, we're going to go ahead and pop it into the, the world famous brick ovens of the homestead. So what you would uh, normally cook, is it like 4 and a quarter for what? I, I think about 400 and uh, you know with, with venison it's so lean yeah. you don't want to go too far. So you want to serve it you know, medium rare, medium at the very, very most. All right. For about 20 minutes. Take it out. We're gonna add a little bit of bacon lardone here, a little bit 
more rosemary to our sauce. I saw you with cognac in the hand, I get excited. Okay, this is gonna cause a fire. We're gonna put the flames out with the white wine so we have some of the alcohol flavor left in there. We don't wanna burn it all the way. Add the nice demi gloss, which is a veal stock reduction. Little bit of tomato paste. Dijon mustard. You're my man. Finish with a little creme fraiche. I'm gonna work that all together, and that will be our sauce. Perfectly cooked. And then we're gonna add the sauce. What do you think? I think it's yep. absolutely perfect. It's simplicity at its uh -huh. best. Yep. So if you thought that was good, let's go outside and cook some of our local trout out on an open fire. You cook an open fire too? Well, I learned it from you. I watched your show. <laughs> So, Chef, you think you guys are the only ones that could cook on an open fire? Look how we do it, Omni Homestead style. Well, I gotta admit, you beat me there to it because <laughs> that's a spectacular setting. If you saw the trout that we pulled out of the stream earlier today. I went there this morning at 7 o'clock. And then something else that you have become very famous here is your Brussels sprouts. We have a famous Brussels sprout recipe that's deep fried Brussels sprouts tossed with our own local honey and some bacon lardons. So, we're gonna start with our fingerling potatoes pre-blanched in some nice salted water to give it some great flavor. Like what do you think, about 80%? Yes. That's nice. We're gonna add a little bit of herbs, some fresh rosemary from our garden, ground sea salt and fresh ground black pepper. And we're gonna take some of our beautiful Allegheny Mountain Trout. Chef, if you'd add the Brussels sprouts to our oil that's been preheated to 350 degrees. And take the Brussels sprouts out of the oil. Mm -hmm. They're nicely fried. Put the lardon here. Mm -hmm. And chef, if you would add some lardon to the pan for me, that's good enough right there. Next, we're gonna be adding our local honey. I'm going to season it with salt and pepper. We're gonna give it a quick toss. Next, we're going to finish our sauce. So we're gonna start with a little more butter. We're gonna add some almonds, grapes, white wine. And we're gonna add a little bit of fresh lemon juice. The resistance is the shaved pecorino cheese on top. on top. And voila, cooked on an open fire. Oh man. Now I know why Thomas Jefferson spent 22 days here in 1818. I've experienced the uniqueness of the homestead myself. Chef Greg and your culinary team, you did outstanding. Thank you very much and allowing us to be part of a taste of history.